So uh, I'm pretty sure it is a well-known um, sort of like fact to everybody that in September, roughly about two years ago, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced that China is going to uh, peak emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. So it is a really big political uh, commitment. Uh, so far, it's been almost two years. Um, the commitment hasn't really been translated into China's domestic uh, policy or legal system because we are currently in the 14th uh, five-year plan period, which is from 2021 to 2025. Essentially, we're so close to 2030, which is the uh, first target, right? Peak emissions before 2030, which is actually a really big step up from the previous commitment, which is about peaking emissions around 2030. So there's so a slight change of wording here actually means the target is more ambitious. But then um, I haven't really seen a lot of uh, changes so far, but then the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party and also the State Council released a very important piece of policy document last year, um, which outlines some of the major areas of work that has been done in the coming uh, years. So one of the very important things there is about revising the relevant laws and uh, regulatory um, arrangements, which are not really compatible with the carbon neutrality uh, targets. So here, um, there are four essential strategies to achieve carbon neutrality in China. So this is really based on uh, the forecastings and modeling uh, which have been done by uh, a lot of Chinese uh, think tanks and other government agencies. So there are some slight differences in terms of the projection, but then all those different projections uh, lead to the four pathways. The first one is uh, decarbonizing power generation through ramping up clean energy, uh, here we're talking about essentially talking about renewables and nuclear. Renewables play more important roles because after the Fukushima um, accident in Japan, I think the Chinese attitude towards nuclear has been changed slightly. So I think the projection about nuclear is that the nuclear investment is going to be more uh, stable than before, which means that nuclear really has, sorry, uh, renewables will have to play uh, bigger roles in terms of decarbonizing uh, power generation in China. Uh, the second pathway is about acceleration of uh, fuel switching. This is pretty much relevant to the first pathway because China is the biggest consumer of coal, which actually generates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Here, China has chosen natural gas as a very important transition um, energy. So natural gas here, uh, is about increasing the supply because China itself doesn't really produce a lot of natural gas. So China really has to import a lot of natural gas from other countries. Um, I'm pretty sure some of you uh, may know this, China is heavily investing in pipelines connecting Central Asia, Russia, Myanmar. China is also importing a lot of LNG from countries like Qatar, Australia. So here, fuel switching is a very important way to really reduce coal consumption. The third pathway is about electrification of end use. China is heavily investing, subsidizing uh, electric vehicles, which is also a very important way to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, based on all the modelings and projections, um, it is nearly impossible for China to completely phase out of coal, uh, which means that China will have to rely on uh, carbon capture and storage or uh, new forest growth to offset some of those uh, emissions. Uh, next slide, please, Asteri. Thank you. So you can tell that like, the reason why I've chosen electricity and gas is simply because electricity and gas play very important roles in terms of uh, facilitating the realization of the initial two pathways, right? Decarbonizing uh, power sector, uh, simply because the power sector in China is very carbon intensive. Uh, Coal-fired generation currently accounts for 65% of electricity supply. Ironically, uh, I'm pretty sure some of you may know this, China is also the pioneer in terms of putting in place renewable energy uh, installation. Um, so the power sector itself produces more than 40% of China's greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the reason why renewable energy will have to be 
further promote it in order to decarbonize uh, power generation. So fuel switching here um, is also critical because increasing natural gas, as I mentioned earlier on, natural gas has been chosen as the transition energy uh, in China. So here the political agenda is about increase the supply of natural gas and also uh, enhancing the efficiency of gas transportation because the gas transportation within the domestic context really relies on the gas pipeline, which is a very important part of the energy uh, infrastructure. Next slide, please. Sorry. So essentially, um, those are the contextual information I want to share with you before I talk about governance and reform of China's network dependent energy uh, industry. When we talk about governance of China's energy system, I think one uh, very important scholarly observation known as fragmented authoritarianism cannot be avoided. Um, Kenneth Liebethal actually and his co-authors uh, made this observation nearly 30 years ago. And based on my research, I have to say this observation is still applicable uh, in China uh, nowadays. Uh, essentially, fragmented um, authoritarianism entails two very important uh, part of the features relevant to the governance of energy system in China. Uh, the first one is the overall decentralization of regulatory power, because since the uh, opening up policy being implemented in the end of 1970s, decentralization of regulatory power is a general trend. Obviously, energy sector is no uh, exception. But more specifically, for the energy sector governance in China, we've seen the rise of both lower level governments, uh, especially provincial governments, and also energy state-owned enterprises, known as the SOEs in China, taking a lot of, uh, playing a lot of important roles in the regulatory space of uh, China's energy sector. So here, decentralization has really led to uh, multi-level regulation, as well as uh, fragmentation of authority. So the second uh, very important part of the uh, fragmented authoritarianism is about authority, right? allocation of um, authority. Here, um, we've seen provincial governments in particular, and also energy SOEs, have actually retained vital aspects of direct influence under the authoritarian framework through nesting in various lines of authority, which can shape the outcomes of China's energy sector uh, development. Uh, this means that looking from the outside, it's actually very difficult to tell which government, which level of government, or which SOEs has more authority over others. So you really have to distinguish more specifically when we look at electricity, gas, coal. So it is very hard to generalize uh, when we talk about allocation of authority. Next slide, please, Stari. Thank you. Uh, so now let's move on to China's power sector, which I think is a very important um, sector when it comes to uh, energy security and, and also decarbonization. So when we talk about this, uh, the power sector uh, in China in terms of the market structure, uh, the overall decentralization has really made provincial government as very important units to manage the power sector uh, in China. So the problem for that is we've seen very limited interprovincial uh, trading of electricity because those provinces, they are responsible for uh, securing electricity supply. So that's why they're driven to actually secure more uh, investment in the generation uh, part to ensure that sufficient electricity is being produced to actually enter the uh, industrial activities. And also provincial governments, uh, when it comes to uh, investment approval in the energy sector, provincial government actually hold a lot of uh, power to approve investment and also manage the electricity system uh, in China, uh, in particular when it comes to dispatch, which I'm going to talk about uh, later. So the reform is a very important part of the um, 
process of managing China's power sector, the initial reform actually took place roughly about 20 years ago. So that reform was very important because it is about breaking down political integration because before there's only one entity in China, which is managing the entire supply chain of the, in the electricity sector, which was not very efficient uh, at all. So breaking down vertical integration here, as we can see in the graph, basically is a separation between generation and transmission. So in China nowadays, we do have competition uh, on the generation side, uh, but then the, uh, here we are looking at essentially the competition between a lot of SOEs, both uh, central SOEs as well as SOEs owned by provincial uh, government. But then the initial reform in 2002 um, wasn't really complete in the sense that there was no separation between transmission and distribution. So essentially the transmission and distribution, even nowadays, are still managed by the three companies in China altogether. Uh, Sorry, if you can just click a bit more. Yes, one more, please. Um, so there are, at the moment, two great companies in China. Uh, State Grid and also China Southern uh, Power Grid. State Grid manages majority of the provinces in the north, but the China Southern Power Grid only manages five provinces in the south. Um, another very important reform actually has been taking place since uh, 2015. And we can tell the aim of or the objectives of the latest reform is about pricing deregulation of wholesale and retail prices liberalizing distribution and retail market, essentially bringing more competition in the downstream uh, market, and also stronger regulation of the transmission uh, network, especially um, in relation to the transmission uh, tariff. So this reform has been ongoing for almost seven years, but the reform process is extremely slow. So essentially, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for that. I'm going to explain uh, a bit later. Uh, but based on the reform objectives, we can tell uh, the reform of China's power sector essentially follows the more liberalized approach by right? competition on the generation and downstream uh, distribution and retail market side. And then uh, transmission is still a natural monopoly. But then obviously, there will be stronger regulation, um, which will be applied to the natural monopoly. Uh, because transparency of uh, the formulation and formation of transmission tariff is very important. But before the process of uh, the formation of the transmission tariff in China wasn't very transparent at all. So that really raised a lot of uh, issues. Um, Astari, please move on to the next slide. And then you can still, yep, yeah, click. Yep, yeah, another one. Thank you. I think. Uh, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the market structure of China's gas sector, uh, there are a lot of similarities. But here, uh, when it comes to governance, uh, it really showcased that uh, provincial governments, uh, energy SOEs play very important roles in the whole process of governing China's uh, gas sector. Here, when we look at the upstream, uh, when we talk about gas exploration, gas import, obviously historically, um, Chinese en energy SOEs, known as national oil companies, play dominant roles. Right? So the market is not really open to any other players. So this issue has been changed uh, starting from 2017, which is fairly recently. Uh, so the upstream market is now open to basically everybody. Uh, so foreign investors can actually have wholly foreign-owned company in China, uh, working in the area of gas exploration, as well as uh, import. Uh, for the mainstream part, um, it is basically a diversification of uh, players. So looking from the top, uh, when we talk about the network infrastructure pipelines, we are essentially looking at domi uh, dominant positions by the NOCs, as well as provincial SOEs. And also uh, city gas companies in China play very important roles in terms of supplying gas to downstream users. Here we are looking at uh, a mixture of 
joint ventures, and also provincial SMEs. So it is really diversified when it comes to the mainstream part. But here, very important three observations. First of all, national oil companies control gas transmission pipelines and also the LNG uh, import terminals. Provincial gas pipelines are pretty much controlled by uh, provincial SOEs, especially because they manage the intro provincial the, uh, transportation within the province. Uh, city gas companies have uh, the number has significantly rising in China in the past decade. So in order to incentivize investment uh, into the distribution network, so those uh, city gas companies have been given concession rights, right, which allow them to actually manage the network supply gas with exclusive rights. So there's basically no competition uh, from others. Um, so these are really the general uh, feature of the governance of China's electricity and gas uh, sector. So what happened recently in terms of the reform, Astari, next slide please, um, is about breaking down vertical integration. Because when we look at the um, ownership and management of the uh, transmission pipelines in China, historically, and we can tell uh, in terms of the long distance pipelines, Hydro-China controlled about 71%. Uh, Sanopec controlled about 6%. And Canuck, which is China's national offshore oil company, uh, controlled about 5%. So these uh, three energy SOEs are China's major national oil companies. And the reason for that difference in terms of the ownership of long distance pipelines because of their historical focus of the supply chain uh, in the uh, gas market in China. PetroChina is the uh, subsidy of China National Petroleum Corporation, which basically, I mean, historically really focused on the upstream exploration import. So that's the reason why PetroChina, I mean, had to invest a lot of long distance transmission pipelines. Well, Sanopac uh, really focused on uh, petrochemical production, refinery, so which is more downstream. Well, Canuck focuses on the offshore oil and gas uh, production. So that's the reason why when it comes to LNG import terminals, right, so the ownership structure really changed. Canuck owned about 48% of LNG import terminals, but China 25%, Sanopec about 16%. So the problems for these different structures of ownership of key gas related infrastructure is that third party access was extremely Limited. There's basically no way as a supplier of gas can actually access to those very important key infrastructure. And also in certain part of China where gas supply, sorry, gas demand is huge, uh, there are actually duplicate pipelines, which is basically overinvestment. Well, in other part of China where demand is very little, there's no infrastructure um, at all. And also there's basically a lack of regulation and transparency in pricing because those NOCs, they play important roles in the policy making process, especially when it comes to uh, pricing. Um, so because of those problems and also the political agenda to increase gas supply, uh, in December, 2019, a very important change was made, which was the establishment of China's National Oil and Gas Pipeline Network Corporation known as Pipe China. So Pipe China basically has acquired um, all those assets from the NOCs uh, so far. But obviously, when we look at the midstream part, there's a very important part of the pipeline, which is intra-provincial pipeline owned by the provincial governments. So the acquisition process or the transfer of those pipelines uh, is still ongoing uh, these days. But it really shows uh, the reform agenda here, which is about forming a natural monopoly, managing the transmission pipelines, and then introducing competition at both ends, right? Production and uh, supply, sorry, uh, distribution and retail. Uh, next slide, please. So here we can tell like, there are a lot of synergies when it comes to reform of electricity and gas market in China. Uh, it is about introducing competition to uh, production supply and also retail markets. 
and also deregulating supply tariffs and retail pricing. Uh, there's also a very important component, which is known as natural monopolies, is that system operation network infrastructure remain regulated, right? especially in terms of prices, transmission tariffs, and also investment. Here, a very important issue is about access to natural monopoly. Uh, so third party access is known as a very important pillar for the energy market liberalization and regulation. The other two very important uh, pillars include uh, trading rules known as network codes and also independent regulator because we need to have an independent regulator to ensure that those market trading rules, third party access rules are fully implemented. So that's the reason why when we look at energy market reform, it is important to actually establish new rules and regulations to ensure that third party access to the key um, energy infrastructure network is safeguarded. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. So more specifically, uh, when we look at China's uh, electricity sector in the context of access, some very basic uh, information about national laws and regulations. Uh, China's electric power law, which was um, promulgated in 1996 and then largely revised in 2018, contains two very important articles. The first one is about regulated electricity pricing. The second one is guaranteed investment uh, return. So these two articles are uh, related in the sense that in order to attract investment into power generation, you have to make sure that investment return is guaranteed through, I mean, most easily through regulated pricing. So these two articles haven't been changed at all despite the uh, 2015 reform to deregulate pricing. Right? So we can already see the bit of contradiction here. Um, what is relevant uh, to the overall sort of guarantee for investment return is about dispatch. So the second point here is that when it comes to dispatch, right, dispatch essentially is about determining which power generators, the electricity from which power generators will be put online first. But then in the context of China, uh, the provincial government has been using uh, administrative allocation of operating hours uh, in the Chinese context is known as equal dispatch, right? So in order to make sure that everybody enjoys investment return in an equal approach, the administrative allocation of operating hours essentially ensures that everybody is treated uh, equally. So the problem for that is obviously if the supply is limited, there's no issue of competition. But then when we try to bring on uh, for instance, uh, renewable energy, uh, clean energy generation online, right? so there will be competition. Dispatch um, is important to ensure that those electricity from clean energy sources can be actually uh, distributed. So this has really created a lot of uh, problems in, uh, in China when it comes to the access by renewable energy uh, to the network. So here, Article 14 of China's Renewable Energy Law requires priority access of renewable uh, to the green network. But in practice, I'm pretty sure some of you have seen this in the news, uh, renewable energy curtailment in China is a big problem. Uh, the rate of curtailment really skyrocketed in around 2016 and 2017 here. Some members feel reference to basically understand the seriousness of this issue here. Um, so for the wind power generation, national average for curtailment is about 17.2%. Uh, some provinces in the north, northwest part of China where renewable energy resources are very abundant, experience very high level of curtailment. Uh, for instance, Gansu, it's uh, 43%, uh, Xinjiang province, 38%. And it's pretty much the same case in solar. I mean, just to give you more sort of like specific ideas about how serious the issue is. So in 2016 uh, alone, the wind curtailment can actually sustain 
electricity supply for a country like Bangladesh uh, for uh, the entire year. So that's how much basically uh, waste has incurred in China in the wind uh, sector. So there are several reasons for uh, renewable energy curtailment. Uh, for instance, lack of infrastructure, uh, the uh, lack of updates of operational and management of the grid company. Uh, but here, based on my research, I think the legal ambiguity uh, really stands out as a very significant problem, which I'm going to explain uh, later. So in order to explain to you what's been happening in terms of the infrastructure in China, because a lot of people actually argue that the reason why curtailment happens in China is because of the lack of infrastructure. Uh, here, a comparison to show you. Uh, Astari, next slide, please. So this map basically shows the major interconnections between China's regional grid back in 2004. As we can see, the interconnection between different parts of China at the time was extremely uh, limited. So China's renewable energy law was put in place back in 2006. So I think around 2010, the interconnection still posed a lot of challenges. The lack of interconnection still posed a lot of challenges. But because China has been heavily investing in the uh, ultra high voltage transmission lines, which is the next slide, Astari, please. Um, here, as we can tell, the interconnection issue in China has been resolved to some extent. If you pay attention to some of the very, uh, some of the purple lines, which is direct current lines, right? So it's basically uni uh, directional transmission from the point of production up in the northwestern part of China, uh, Xinjiang and Gansu, and then all the way to the consumption points in the coastal uh, regions. So this has been possible when it comes to very long distance transmission, right? So connecting the uh, production point of renewable energy to the consumption point. So the infrastructure wise, I don't think that's a problem um, anymore. So here, the problem is really about to what extent access is being enabled. Um, Astari, next slide, please. So very briefly, here are some of the insights from uh, my research about uh, the green dispatch experiment in China, which was only carried out for a very short period of time. So green dispatch is actually prioritized renewable. Right, so this is a really important implementation practice uh, in support of Article 14 of China's Renewable uh, Energy Law. So here, um, I've seen basically three uh, major uh, issues and problems. Uh, the first one is local protectionism, and especially because uh, when it comes to the provincial context, provincial SOEs, state-owned enterprises, have had a, a lot of investment in uh, coal fire generation. So they really rely on uh, equal dispatch or administrative dispatch to ensure investment returns. So the competition between those um, provincial SOEs and renewable energy is really fierce. And obviously, provincial governments here have a lot of uh, vested interest uh, in terms of safeguarding uh, the interest of provincial uh, SOEs, often at expenses of renewable energy uh, production. The second issue here is about the resistance from the great enterprises in China. Great enterprises in China, they are hugely uh, powerful in the sense that they can actually resist undesirable policies from the central government in many ways. So here, uh, my observation is that uh, integrating renewable at a higher level obviously requires operational and management changes, which can be very costly. Um, although renewable energy law has uh, a very important provision known as cost sharing, but then the cost sharing doesn't really cover the cost of um, updating uh, operational and management changes for those um, grid companies. Uh, the final challenge, which I think is the biggest challenge when it comes to uh, implementation of the law, um, is the lack of clear definition um, here. Uh, refusal to grant access is allowed. Uh, it is actually allowed in many other jurisdictions as well. But then in the context of China, refusal to grant access 
is possible if integrating renewable energy can pose threats to grid security and reliability. But here the term, uh, here a very important term, grid security and reliability is not yet to be clearly defined. Although uh, there was an independent uh, regulator in the electricity sector in China before, but it's been abolished many years ago. So that regulator actually um, sort of like really um, actively advocated uh, for this term to be defined. But even till nowadays, the term is not defined. So what happens is that uh, when it comes to practice, especially in the power purchase agreement, great company will include this term in the contract, basically exempts them from taking any liability. So that's the reason why I did some search about relevant cases, like disputes between renewable energy and great companies in China. I couldn't find any. Right? So this is really, I think, one of the biggest uh, problem and also the uh, issue that will have to be uh, addressed. So that's the reason why when it comes to investing in renewable energy generation in China, it is important to ensure that access is properly arranged. Otherwise, investors will have to face a lot of financial losses, which I think is a real risk when it comes to investment. So moving on to the um, next slide, please, Astari. So moving on to the regulatory framework supporting uh, the operation of uh, Pipe China. Um, essentially, there are two very important uh, pillars include independence of pipeline assets um, supported by a more transparent tariff regime and also the rules on TPA to ensure uh, fair opening of gas pipeline uh, network. Um, I've seen a lot of improvement here. Uh, the new regulations are obviously more clearly um, worded than the regulations governing China's electricity sector. And a very important um, change is about encourage uh, third party access. Um, here, um, the method to do that is actually uh, cap the uh, profitability rate of gas pipeline enterprises, which is 8%. This is actually considered to be relatively higher than any other energy sectors in China. And also, the rate is only applicable when the load factor, which is about the usage rate of the pipeline, is 75% and above. So it essentially encourages um, third party access. And then uh, pipeline companies are incentivized to actually encourage third party access. Um, our story, next slide, please. So a very important um, regulation, which is known as the measures on the supervision and administration of fair opening of oil and gas pipeline facilities issued back in uh, 2019, essentially contained two very important uh, provisions, Article 9 and Article uh, 12. So both articles uh, basically uh, stipulate that uh, pipeline operators will have the obligation to contract with suppliers. So there's no reason they can say no. Uh, but then at the same time, um, I've seen conditional third party access, uh, which is basically in you know, paragraph two of Article 12. So this paragraph um, only allows pipeline operator to open the pipeline facilities to users on the condition that the services to the existing users are guaranteed. Essentially, existing users are the national oil uh, company. And also uh, the relevant uh, policy makers made a statement regarding this uh, reservation is that full opening is only uh, allowed when the reform of uh, the gas sector in China is complete. Uh, because as I mentioned early on, the transfer of the provincial pipeline to Pub China is still ongoing. So the reform I think will go on uh, for uh, several years. So when it comes to TPA, a very important uh, part of the regulatory framework is about evaluation and management of pipeline capacity scarcity. Uh, this very important piece of uh, regulation is yet to be uh, finalized. There's a draft regulation for public comments, but it is yet to be 
uh, finalized and implemented. And obviously, uh, the reform is also partial in the gas sector so far. It is still a work in progress. Um, I'll start the next slide, please. So here are some of the challenges uh, for the ongoing reform, especially the, uh, what they call the independent operation of Pipe China um, is about the implementation of the third party access rules. Uh, I mentioned earlier on, uh, so the challenges facing Pipe China is about to what extent they can actually integrate intra-provincial pipelines to Pipe China. So I'm saying many different ways so far, but obviously China has a lot of provinces and then the transfer integration process will take a very long time. Um, another big challenge, which I think is very difficult to resolve, is about the contradiction between third-party access and concession rights, right? because concession rights essentially allow city gas companies to avoid competition. But then obviously, the recent reform is about bringing competition into the distribution side. So the recent change is a lot of provinces in China they have been discussing about the ways to terminate concession rights. And obviously there will be a lot of investment <laughs> disputes uh, arise in the, coming, in the coming decades, because most of the time concession rights will last for about 30 years. So obviously I think for a lot of investors, they have only enjoyed the concession rights for like 10, 15 years, and then there's a possibility for the concession rights to be terminated. But again, it's a real risk for investment uh, losses. Another, I think, perhaps from my point of view, the biggest challenge is about enforcement capacity. Although I think looking from our side, China is a single party government, people will assume that implementation enforcement is strong, but in the energy sector, I think it's a very different story because when we talk about enforcement, we are looking at the um, National Energy Administration, NEA, known as NEA. So fairly recently, NEA has been openly criticized by China's uh, Central Environmental Inspection Team for its lack of capacity to uh, stop the continuing expansion of coal-fired generation uh, in China. Um, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why NEA doesn't really enjoy that strong enforcement uh, capacity. But when it comes to the reform of electricity and gas sectors in China, and especially when it comes to implementation of the TPA rules, NEA is the enforcement agency. And obviously, I think NEA will have to deal with a lot of resistance from national oil companies, provincial governments, and also another real concern is about national oil companies' influence on China's operation. So I'm saying basically the transfer of stuff from PetroChina to Pipe China. Obviously, I think those people, when it comes to uh, daily operation, uh, will to some extent favor NOCs because obviously they used to work there. They still have that uh, connection. So here, and obviously when we talk about regulating the network infrastructure um, to what extent independent regulator or regulatory agencies can be realized in China is a real challenge. So I will stop there. My apologies for going over time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> will we pick up um, online. Um, perhaps, um, well, if anyone has a query or question, please. Thank you, How this is very um, comprehensive and really interesting to hear about the challenges that are happening in China right now. I was just wondering when you talk about third party access and the objective of bringing in more competition, um, does it mean that it's opening, the government wants to open up the sector to private sector um, investments? And also, is it open to um, overseas investments as well? Indeed. Yeah. So when I talk about TPA, because essentially TPA um, is about non-discriminatory access to the natural monopolies by 
NH companies. So here, NH companies basically will be investors coming from China, private investors, as well as investors coming from overseas. So especially, um, I mean, I mentioned earlier on for uh, coal fire generation, even though there's competition, but essentially it's a competition between Chinese SOEs, right? Provincial, central. Um, in a lot of cases, the interests of those SOEs are not really aligned, but obviously they're more driven by profit making. Um, but then for renewable energy uh, sector, um, the investors are really diversified. So we're saying, uh, for instance, investors from SOEs, central provincial, as well as joint ventures, and also foreign investors. So that's the reason why, without having clear rules for the party access, those investors, generators, will be treated differently, right? which is not really uh, desirable in the context of decarbonization and also pursuing of carbon neutrality. Right, because we have to really prioritize those renewable energy generators by right, making sure that their electricity will be consumed first. Um, so that's the reason why when we talk about reform um, of electricity and gas, there are a lot of similarities. And so for, as a follow up, this um, geopolitics enter into the um, equation here. Do they discourage investments from uh, countries that they think are not aligned with their like politics. Like for example, there is like a, a competition with the like, US, for example. This not is that um enter into the conversation at all? Well I think geo I mean when we talk about energy law, well, geopolitics definitely play a very important role because I think I mean when we talk about energy law, we really have to deal with I think three very important issues at least. The first one is energy security, right? Especially about securing supply. The second one is about the social aspects, right? So making sure that everybody has access to energy. Uh, the final aspect is really about environmental concerns, for, ex uh, for example, uh, environmental protection, uh, climate mitigation. Right? So I think energy law plays a very important role in terms of managing that three different aspects. So when it comes to China, obviously, I think for the moment, the focus is still on securing energy security which is the most important uh, part of the overall regulatory framework. So that's the reason why when you look at China's energy law, for instance, electric power, right, I, which I show you uh, just now. So the essential articles are still pretty much about attracting investments. Right? So it is the same sort of like idea for renewable energy law and renewable energy law in China. Sorry, I forgot to mention that has a has a very important provision on that spending tariff. Spending tariff has been commonly used across many jurisdictions. China is the same. Um, although spending tariffs in China are phasing out, for instance, I think spending uh, tariffs for uh, wind sector in China, both onshore and offshore, have already been removed, hundred percent. But before, because of the higher spending tariff, that really attracts a lot of investment. So I think geopolitics here, I mean, plays a very important role. So that's the reason why China is really trying to diversify import channels, right? So not really relying on a single country. So when it comes to coal, for instance, China has really um, imported coal from Australia, Mongolia uh, in recent years, Indonesia. But then I think we have seen that in the news about the bilateral relationship between China and Australia has gone sour. Uh, the coal import from Australia has been suspended. But then in the context of China, when the coal price really skyrocketed, uh, the coal from Australia is allowed. Right? So here you can really see like the Chinese policymakers have really faced a lot of different challenges in terms of managing often very contradictory objectives. Yeah, Aaron, thank you so much. Oh, I thank you very much. Has, uh, yeah, um, please, Michael, um, join us. Uh, we've um, just finished house talk, but uh, please also, there's all food there. Please don't let it go to waste. Help, help yourselves. Aaron, did you have a, a query? And then I want to ask about <clears throat> weathering uh, a couple of things. So, Aaron, please. 
Um, yeah, thanks, Howard. And I had to drop out in the middle of that, so I'm really sorry if this is a dumb question. Um, but one of the things that was just occurring to me when you were describing the trajectory of reform and the shift into this market regulatory mechanism, I think Australia has just received a really sharp lesson about the limits of market regulation as a tool for energy security. And so I just wondered whether that lesson is being picked up in the, in the China law and policy space at all. Well, thank you, Ari. I knew somebody was going to raise that question. Um, I think there have been a lot of reflections about what they call textbook approach, right? Because I think textbook approach, especially those um, which has been adopted in the EU, here in Australia, um, has been recognised as the way to be. But obviously, I think, uh, for instance, Australia really experienced a lot of um, access issues before. Uh, sorry, the balancing issue before in South Australia uh, in the um, event of extreme weather conditions. And also fairly recently because of the uh, soaring price of natural resources. Um, I think in the context of China, although the general trend is moving towards liberalization, I think government regulation and intervention will still be there. A good example is the coal market in China. Coal market in China has been liberalized decades ago. All right, so free market pricing, uh, very limited uh, regulation, market regulation. But then when it comes to coal pricing, especially for SOEs, the uh, National Development and Reform Commission still relies on a lot of method to actually control coal pricing just for SOEs. But obviously on the free market, the prices are regulated. And I think it's going to be very much the same case for other energy supply, right? So when we talk about electricity and gas, although the general trend is going to be liberalization, but I think the government, especially energy regulators in China, will still reserve a lot of space for intervention and regulation, just to avoid those issues that he mentioned just now. Excellent question. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> and if I may follow up on that one, because um, uh, it was interesting to see your three points about what are the prior, if you like, the three priorities that you see the Chinese energy law still um, having, uh, if you like, those residual energy security, and then more than residual, and in fact, Australia too. Um, and in fact, Australia has moved with the introduction of the Energy Security Board to actually strengthen uh, up, up to those um, extreme weather events, uh, ideas of reliability of supply. And politically, it's very difficult in some ways, whatever liberalized or decentralized model that you have of energy governance, to actually politically move away from that now. Democratically, uh, that is a big thing for governments um, in Australia and EU, but perhaps less in the EU. So I'm wondering whether that political thing around energy security, do you think the balance will shift towards a more strongly liberalised market, provided you know, you've still got that problem that you identify with the the reliability and it's, it's, you know, how is that being interpreted or how is it being put into play operationally? And it seems that those are critical things at those operational points of dispatch um, that you're still seeing some of those political um, security issues play out. So I'm just saying, if you have a future days, do you think that's that's going to dissipate or do you think it will still remain as it does even in a strongly liberalized sector that we have here in electricity in australia you still have the residual security issues well that's a really good question um i mean based on my observation of china i think i'm just getting really cautious when it comes to generalization yeah absolutely. <laughs> because in a sense that there are so different situations faced by the local uh, provincial governments uh, in China. Even when we talk about, for instance, uh, gas and electricity market, where the regulations share a lot of similarities, but when it comes to implementation, we still have to distinguish uh, provinces which actually produce more 
uh, whereas demand is less, and in other provinces, they really have to import a lot of uh, power from other places. Um, so I think the general trend, obviously, at least from the central government point of view, is towards liberalization because they want to see competition to reduce prices. Here, I think they're not really driven by the whole idea of liberalization. I think they're more driven by the benefits arising from liberalization, which is about competition to reduce price, because obviously monopoly, and especially in the context of um, the gas mining in China, I have saw the uh, calculation some others did before about gas pricing. So essentially the gas pricing significantly increased towards the downstream part, uh, which really showed that city gas companies have a lot of factory power when it comes to basically the formation of the price. Yeah. So that's the reason why in order to reduce the price of gas, they really have to break down that monopoly. Yeah. So here liberalization has been used as a way to achieve a certain political agenda. But then, I mean, coming back to the uh, question Aaron raised just yeah. now and also the security <laughs> issue, I don't think the uh, Chinese government will give up any control surrounding security. Although there has been some shift from 100% ensuring security to sort of like a mix of political agenda to ensure security and decarbonization, but I think the focus will still be on security of supply. Mm, that's right. mm. Really interesting. And for the water people in the room, that trend towards centralization, Murray Darling Basin regulation um, keeps playing into my thoughts as a powerful speaker about the different, uh, you think about provincial and SOEs as sort of state governments with their water. I think there's lots of lessons that the, um, and also around what happened with the attempts to put liberalized markets, for example, here in Victoria, Erin, um, in uh, that semi sort of corporatized SOE type model that was sort of a Clayton's competition model here in, um, in, the, in the urban sector here. So I think it's really interesting to see some of the, the parallels at play there and also around how much your provincial or your decentralized units are prepared to give up uh, in, in that. I've got one, if I may, one more. <laughs> Lock in of your infrastructure, your whole things on the gas. Gas is still a fossil fuel bridging. <laughs> I mean, why don't people sort of go, oh, excuse me? And it's yeah. sort of dug out of the ground and oil companies typically look at the role in yeah. why, I mean, here in Australia, the gas industry has been so effective at selling itself as a bridging transition. Yeah. I was just so so taken by the fact that that's what's happened in China too, even despite the leapfrogging that China did very early on with wind and solar, you've actually seen the lobbying, I would call it lobbying, by um, oil, and, uh, sorry, oil and gas to be able to sell itself as the transition. Notwithstanding that you're locking in for 30, 40 yep. years, you've got concession rights. So you are locking in what does that mean for carbon, for carbon neutrality, I guess? Absolutely agree. I think it's, uh, I mean, the reason why natural gas has been chosen, um, I mean, not just in China, I mean, as you mentioned, in Australia, in Germany, I think Germany really suffers a lot because of that choice, yes, which we made so many years ago. Um, I think it's a middle ground uh, in terms of sort of like managing the adjustment of benefits arising from pursuing carbon neutrality targets, because I think NOCs in China, they are super powerful. Right? So they, they obviously have to reduce the consumption of petrol to the extent possible, while at the same time, they have to maintain their business. So I think natural gas naturally sort of like comes in um, as a way to maintain their business and also um, developing the technology, because I think what they're really trying to focus on is uh, tapping to the unconventional gas in China. But obviously, I think tapping to the unconventional gas in China requires a lot of new technology, which those NOCs don't necessarily have, which is also part of the reason why the upstream exploration sector has been opened up. Essentially, I think one important 
motivations is about introducing new technologies, which often owned by foreign companies, yeah, foreign national oil companies, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to actually develop those unconventional gas in China. Great, thank you. That's really interesting. Yeah, please. I was really interested in the point that you made about weak enforcement and was recalling that when that had been a problem in relation to provincial um, environment protection agencies, there was a move to thinking about things like career incentives to enforce better, as well as kind of just direct regulation. Has that been part of the conversation in terms of improving enforcement in this space? It well? is, it is. It is a very important, I mean, I, I mean, there are a lot of changes actually. Uh, I think one important change is um, uh, recentralization, as we mentioned, because when we mentioned about recentralization, Right away, I thought about uh, the uh, Central Environmental Inspection Team. So that was, um, so the team essentially before was um, ad hoc, right? so it's only temporary, but now they have actually institutionalized that inspection. So the inspection basically originally covered only environmental issues, but now the uh, responsibility has expanded. For instance, NEA, I mentioned this early on in my presentation, that NEA has been criticized by the central inspection team about its failure to control the expansion of coal fire, which is not really something part of their environmental agenda, obviously it is one of the issues here. And also for renewable energy access. So obviously the market approach doesn't really work that well in China. So starting from 2018, we've seen stronger central government intervention, relying on exactly as you mentioned, right? So incentives. So they are using targets, they are using mandates, they are using um, the uh, appraisal of government officials. So that has even been expanded into the party stream as well. So before the appraisal only focused on government officials like public servants, but now the party members will have to be responsible as well. So they're really trying to sort of like the re-centralize some of the control and then trying to redirect provincial government to do the right thing. But obviously, there has been a lot of resistance. Um, I mean, I can't really talk about this forever. So I'll give you one example. Central government has been using what they call traffic light system to actually label each indiv individual um, province for uh, renewable energy access, right? So if the curtailment rate is more than 10%, percent you will be given a red light meaning that you can't really do any further investment in coal fire. Right? But then there are so many different ways for provincial government to actually resist that. Because NEA doesn't really have that manpower to go to every single province to inspect. Yeah, so clearly, I think centralization has been used as a way, and there's so many other methods as well. But to what extent it is effective, it is very hard to tell from outside. But based on the secondary information I have, I don't think that's really effective for now. And also another issue is to what extent those measures will be sustainable. Because it does require a lot of resources, which is very costly. Yeah. What a classic story of environmental law. And <laughs> <laughs> enforcement question. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, Caitlin, please. Sure, thanks so much um, for such an interesting talk. Um, I've got quite a specific question and it's really from my own ignorance. I'm trying to get my head around the connections between pricing and infrastructure and their impacts on labor and extraction at the moment. And um, I was really interested in what you were saying about the process of pricing, inviting investment and you sort of, um, you were able to say a bit more about the kind of process of how that happens. Thanks. Well, excellent question. Um, so essentially, when it comes to pricing, uh, the formation of the pricing is basically uh, based on the uh, investment cost. So there's a calculation about um, the cost of the investment. And obviously, that will be factored into the span of that investment over the coming uh, years. And also, there will be considerations given to, for instance, uh, profitability rate. Uh, so those different factors will be factored in and then the price will be set. So essentially, uh, when it comes to, uh, let's say, electricity pricing in China, uh, the pricing bureau after the National Development Reform Commission will issue benchmark pricing 
for generators falling into different technological class. Right? So because if you use different technologies, the cost obviously the investment will be different. So those will be considered and then benchmark pricing will be given to each province based on different generator types. Right? So that's really how, because for investors, if they see the benchmark pricing, and it's very easy for them to figure out whether they can actually make money or not over the coming years. Right? So that's the whole idea of uh, guaranteeing investment return through regulated pricing. Um, Caitlin, just on that, you might also want to have a look at the um, national electricity market rules here in Australia to give you some sense where we have a slightly different model where it's not uh, the guarantee on investment is done differently. Um, so um, Australia operates a much more free market model for pricing, but there were attempts when there were issues arising through what we might call energy poverty, when the gas prices go through the roof and there's a lot of political pressure, there were at least some murmurings about um, <clears throat> state governments intervening or at least trying to set default market prices here in Australia a couple of, oh, a couple of years ago. So if you're wanting to have a look at that pricing, in, uh, you know, and um, just the way in which um, pricing um, works and slightly differently, and here it's also, I'm drawing on my water lawyers and um, friends as well, um, will be decided by an independent agency. So the market model um, <clears throat> in China, the liberalized um, market model hasn't got this other leg, if you like, in terms of your pricing being set by a third party regulator. So um, that's the way it works. And infrastructure costs are one of the things that, that for example, in water and electricity, um, those sort of infrastructure costs are part of the calculation for what's sort of allowable in terms of, of um, yeah. not so much pricing because that's the next downward leg, but in terms of, of what can be done in terms of trans you know, tra work on transmissions or you know, is there a requirement, for example, uh, for an extension of um, transmission by um, uh, a distributor, uh, distributor effectively. So if there's another bit to the system here in Australia. Yeah. Anyone want to comment, I mean, on some of the urban water? And it's also pertinent to, to some of the, uh, the recovery costs for water, uh, particularly in, in urban areas as well. Um, any more questions or no? I just leave a oh, yes, yes, small yes. question. Yeah. Um, enthusiasm for microgrids um, is is there any in China? I mean, it seems to be kind of bubbling along here in Australia. Does it does it exist in China? Uh, microgrids. Are you referring to like neighbourhood scale almost? Um, so renewable energy communities. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, been writing an article on that. Uh, for the moment, I think China is still at the stage of uh, encouraging uh, distributed energy generation because initially renewable energy law of China only focused on large scale uh, upstream renewable energy generation because I think for distributed, the issue here is really about how do you actually, right, for example, feeding your electricity back to the grid. Uh, in China, it's still not that possible at the moment. Um, at the residential level, but at the commercial level, it is possible. So basically, uh, the distributed energy generators will be treated equally according to renewable energy law, right? So the same level of getting tariff, for example, if you putting like install like a uh, rooftop solar panels at large scale, you will enjoy getting tariff. But then the problem right now is, I think renewable energy communities in China are still pretty much driven by uh, poverty elevation, which I think is a very sort of like unique way of making sure that everybody has access to energy, but it hasn't really been expected um, in China domestically. And 
in some ways, depending on how you see it, Australia sees it as, as reaching some of the rural communities and so on, and the community based uh, uh, was actually filling gaps in your transmission system because there wasn't, you know, I, I saw your map of that huge investment that China has yeah. just put into transmission. So in some ways, microgrids were solving some of those reliability and the huge extended um, distribution that Australia has to have a, a, because of continental size. So in some ways, microgrids are filling a, a different niche in some ways. Yeah. I mean, and it depends what you're talking about in the rural, obviously. But your whole prosumer stuff that's being enabled through the uh, through particularly in the urban sector here. Um, so that's not that's not happening in China, but it's commercial. So it's more it's more commercial. I mean, as I mentioned, I think uh, the new managed communities are pretty much like driven by energy poverty elevation. Yeah. So it is still like micro grades, but only at the um, rural area. For example, in the northwestern part of China, where the new energy resources is abundant because without that microgrids obviously those electricity will be wasted but that's also the way to actually encourage local consumption without transporting it also depends on the scale obviously right this really large scale i think it's naturally connected so it's actually being planned as part of the infrastructure so there'll be uh, for instance uh, ultra ultra high voltage transmission lines uh, connecting that large scale sort of power power generation to consumption point. Well, it just leaves me now to thank how very much for a wonderful insights, the detailed knowledge, and just for, for being with us today. So well, thank, thank you. you.